All right. So 268 words, 10 sentences, two minutes. That's all. 268 words, 10 sentences, two minutes. Okay. That's all it took to create and deliver what, in my humble opinion, is the greatest speech of all time. So what am I talking about? Of course. It was Bill Murray's interview of Punks Tony Phil on Groundhog Day, the movie. Nah, I'm kidding. Of course not. It's Lincoln's Gettysburg Address of November 1863. So I'm going to break down the speech and describe to you what I think are three key components of that particular speech. The setting or the audience, the use of rhetorical devices such as alliteration, triads, repetition, and finally his really solid conclusion and why those really make up the speech and make what I consider the best speech ever. So first, because his audience were the people that were in a cemetery, which had just been lost, or won actually, the Union won, but there were thousands of men that were killed, and it was very hollowed ground, hallowed ground. They, just, they actually, it was a very decisive battle, if you know the history of this country. And also because the weather was pretty vile, it was very non calescent because it was November, and he also knew that he was gonna be behind a pretty boisterous politician, so he had not much time left. People were not gonna be very patient about having listened to perhaps a very, very long speech. Then he had only a few minutes, he thought. So that's why he devised his speech in the limited time he had, knowing it was also gonna be cold out there and the audience was gonna be restless. So those are some of the reasons. In other words, he knew the setting, he knew the audience. That's the first thing any good speech writer, any good speaker or orator is gonna to need to know is, is your audience, who are you talking to? Second, his use of words were really eloquent, yet they were very simple. He wanted to take advantage of the situation he was in, the location he was in, a great victory for his army that was paid for, however, at a very steep price, with a goal of advocating for bringing to a, together both sides, both sides, the Union and the Confederacy, for the preservation of something bigger than the individual parts, of course, the country. He knew that as a leader, his weapons were not what was just shown in this battlefield, death and destruction of guns and knives and artillery, but his use of words. Those were his weapons. He employed them really beautifully. And I'll explain to you why in just a few sentences. So the first sentence, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now think about it, four score and seven, isn't that much more poetic than strictly 87? Of course. Again, good use of that particular time. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. So here he uses contrast very effectively by stating, for instance, those who here gave their lives that this nation might live. Think about it, the just juxtaposition of lives and living and, and death. So again, it's a very compelling argument is using contrast, another rhetorical term that you want to use. People are naturally attracted to opposites, so presentations should draw from this attraction to create interest. Communicating an idea that is juxtaposed from polar opposites tends to lead to give energy to that speech. So think about that as you're preparing your own speech someday. So moving back and forth between opposites is a really good technique. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. Notice the use of triads. You've probably seen this a lot, triple words or triple phrases. Cannot dedicate, cannot concentrate, cannot hallow. Triads are a very powerful public speaking technique that can add authority to your words and make them, of course, very memorable. People tend to think in short snippets. Threes are very, the brain is kind of hardwired to think of things in threes. So try saying that sentence, not now, but out loud, and hear the very powerful cadence and the rhythm of it. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. There's an alliteration, poor power, okay, using the same sentence, the same two words starting with the same letter, poor power. That's an alliteration. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Again, here's a double contrast in this particular sentence. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but I can never forget what they did here. You see those two? You got remember and forget, say and did. Great use of, the, of those particular techniques there. That particular technique. 
And the last one, blah, 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 shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now here there's a couple of contrasts. Okay, these dead shall not have died in vain, with this nation shall have, an, shall have a new birth of freedom. Again, death and living. And of course, he finishes with a very powerful triad, the triple that we all know, for the people, of the people, by the people. I think I said it wrong, but that's, you get the idea. And lastly, his use of repetition. His use of repetition are two little words you probably don't know much about, but the two words he uses most often, and repetition-wise, are we and here. He uses both those 10 times and eight times, respectively, throughout that 268-word speech. He's trying to understand using the trick of repetition, which is, again, a very great aspect of, of public speaking. The trick is knowing, however, what to do, how to use the, re the repetition, and sometimes the little words have the most impact. So think about that. And finally, he uses a very, very powerful call to action. Again, again, a very met a good method of imparting your views on how to convince the audience of the importance of your message. So here it is. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's really telling us what he envisions do excuse me, doing. So let me give you a brief, I think we've got some time here, a brief idea of what I'm talking about here. Two minutes. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation, so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add. say here, but it could never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. All right, pretty powerful when you hear it. So in summary, if we as Toastmasters, if we're truly to be students of the best techniques of oration, speech writing and listening, we need to go further than reading what is inscribed in granite on the inside of the Lincoln Memorial, Bill Murray's Ode to a Groundhog. Sorry. It's, of course, the time-tested Gettysburg Address. In my humble opinion, the best speech ever given. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Gary.